So whenever a patient with the intracranial infection comes to emergency department, um, it is mostly the CT brain which is ordered first. However, in pediatric setting and if there is availability, MR brain, brain is a go-to technique because it resolves most of our queries. Because these patients are not, uh, you know, they are not stable enough. Some of them have altered sensorium. You might choose a rapid acquisition protocol. A contrast uh, study is uh, is frequently uh, mandatory in most cases, and we need to include a post contrast flare so that any meningeal pathology can be picked up. If you have the option of completing a study, you know, on and run some advanced protocol, you might as well choose. MR spectroscopy for uh, space occupying lesions like an intraparenchymal abscess. You might consider doing vessel wall imaging and an MR angiogram for patients presenting with uh, infarcts or vesculopathy and arterial spin labeling in patients suspected of having viral or autoimmune pathology. Now, when you are reviewing this scan, it is always better that if you have the, you know, the clinical overview and a medical chart in front of you, you, you know the clinical background. Start seeing from the epidural, subdural spray, uh, space. Look at the, you know, the uh, the pecky meninges, the lepto meninges, the parenchyma for any signal alteration, abscesses, granulomas, or features of encephalitis, any micro hemorrhages or bleeds that you see. Look at the ventricles. Are they enlarged? Is there any sign of developing hydrocephalus? Uh, are there any enhancement in the ventricular margin? Is there any feature of ventriculitis or correct ple uh, plexitis? Uh, look at the paralysis, sinuses, uh, the temporal bone, cranial nerve, and spine if you have done the imaging for that. So let us uh, start with some case example. This 14-year-old uh, female presented with fe uh, fever, right focal seizure with loss of speech. Now in the plain scan, we can very well appreciate these uh, uh, subdural uh, space collections which are showing peripheral enhancement on the left side, on the left frontal convexity. There is a small collection on the right frontal convexity as well. And on the SAG image, if you see, you can uh, see this uh, subdural collection as well as there is some soft tissue opacification on the frontal sinus. In the bone windows, you can very well appreciate the osteolysis of the frontal uh, sinus wall as well as breach in the inner table as marked by the red arrow. And there is collection in the enter into hemispheric fissure as well. So on examination, there was a uh, right orbital skin changes. So we went back and saw the scan. Yes, there were some uh, soft tissue pacification of the conal and the extra conal space on the right orbit. So the patient had orbital cellulitis as well. So the complete diagnosis here will be frontal sinusitis, sinusitis leading to you know uh, frontal subdural empyma as well as interhemispheric space empyma and right-sided orbital cellulitis. A, a companion case, this 10-year-old uh, presented with fever and left hemispheresis and was actually sent to us for evaluation of stroke. Uh, his uh, TLC counts were raised. So it's very obvious that we have diffusion uh, restricting subdural empyma, bilateral sub frontal convexities, and the interhemispheric inter fissure. But if you play, uh, pay attention, you can find that there is collection in the right frontal sinus, which is showing diffusion restriction. So when you see this kind of diffusion restricting collection, in the frontal sinuses, it should be given much importance. As well, there, there is certain degree of diffusion restriction in the uh, in the right basal frontal area, which might correlate with the patient's symptom. This is the SAG image, which shows the peripherally enhancing collection uh, along the sub, uh, subdural space. And you can also appreciate the enhancement of the frontal sinus. So again, a case of subdural and extradural empyma, secondary to frontal sinusitis. Now this uh, this 11 year old boy had fever, headache, and vomiting for 25 days, and these are the basic images if you, uh, that you see. So how does it appear? A T2 uh, no hyperintense cystic lesion with multiple internal septas. It shows wall restriction only with that too very patchy. And on the post contrast scan, you see a very well defined you know uh, thin wall uh, enhancement. Fine. Now the abscess is not showing complete uh, diffusion restriction, but if you play again uh, close attention, you can see the dura, which is in contact with the temporal bone. It is thickened and it is showing enhancement. Even in this particular image, you can see the arrow. The dura is thickened and it is showing uh, enhancement. So patient actually had the classical dual rim sign. 
just to reiterate that this is the SWM same image. You see this classical dual rim sign where there is an inner hyper intensity on the SWI, which represents the granulation tissue, and the outer hypo intense rim, which represents the fibrocollagenous membrane of a abscess. This is classical of a pyogenic abscess. So we were dealing with an abscess that was sure the tumor was ruled out. What was there with the bone? So we went ahead with the CT scan. If you see bilateral mastoids, there is sclerosis on the left side and you can demonstrate the tagment breach. So basically this was a case of, uh, you know, cerebral abscess secondary to uh, mastoiditis. The patient actually had this on further probing. We found the patient had ear discharge five to six days, uh, one month back. And then the patient started developing this symptom. So it is very important that you do not forget to evaluate the paranasal sinuses and temporal bone whenever encountered with subdural empyma or abscesses which are close to the skull base like the mastoids, the paranasal sinuses and the sphenoid sinus. Now the next uh, common manifestation that we see is varying types of meningitis. So if you see this uh, you know, graphical representation, you can have diffuse pecky meningeal thickening which most often is secondary to a, uh, you know, uh, a vasculitic cause or an inflammatory cause. You can have diffuse leptomeningeal uh, enhancement. You can have focal leptomeningeal enhancement. You can have associated cerebritis or you can have associated ventriculitis. And all of these will have different differential diagnosis depending on the case, case wise. So we will see certain uh, examples. So if you see this particular set of three images on the left hand side, you see that there is focal leptomeningeal enhancement, which is epicentered at the left sylvian fissure and on the left cerebral uh, uh, convexity. You compare bilateral side, there is effacement of the sulcal uh, spaces on the left side. You can see the sulcal spaces very well on the right side. So this kind of convexity predominant meningitis is more frequently seen in pyogenic infections. Whereas if you see this kind of diffuse meningitis with a basal predominant, you're dealing with a chronic or a subacute meningeal pathology, which is more often in our country, a tubercular infection, at time atypical bacterial infection or a fungal infection. So this is the first differential point, whether the meningitis or the meningeal pathology is convexial dominant or a basal cisternal dominant. Now let, look, uh, let us look at this example, this four year old kid with congenital heart disease presented with fever, headache and left sided hemiparesis. So if you see, I have shown you multiple cases of stroke. In our country, uh, unlike developed country, infection is a most common cause of pediatric stroke. Like in foreign countries, it's most likely a vasculopathy or inflammatory pathology. For our country, it's most commonly infection. So if you see this particular set of images, this is the flare image on the right hand side. You can see that there is some of our flare hyper intensity along with diffusion restriction, which are in the territory of insular branches and the, you know, involving the posterior part of the insula. This is the post contrast even image which shows enhancement along the right sylvian fissure. And we, I always do an MR angiogram in all patients of my meningitis if they have any diffusion pathologies or otherwise even. And here you can see that there are irregularity in the insular branches of the right MCA. So this is a case of pyogenic meningitis with secondary vasculitis. So we see vasculitis more common in tubercular, but they are not uncommon in pyogenic meningitis as well. In this case, uh, again, a case of subdural empyma, but in this case, there was no meningeal, I mean, there was no parental sinus pathology or a mastoid pathology. You can see this kind of loculated subdural, uh, you know, uh, 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 empyma, which is extending to the contralateral side as well, extending to interhemisphere tissue as well as there is a leptomeningeal uh, thickening. So we have to understand that uh, streptococcus is a very common pathogen in this kind of pathology. They can present with both subdural empyma or subdural effusion. You have to, re you have to rely on the diffusion weighted images. If it is restricting, if you are dealing with a subdural empyma, if it is non-restricting, you are usually dealing with a subdural effusion. And this is and the other pathogens that can cause subdural effusions are uh, Staphylococcus aureus or androbes.